And we welcome you to episode 31 of the second season of the Exit Philosophy Podcast. Rich Griffin over there, Scott MacArthur here. And if you're listening, wherever you get your podcasts, here, there, anywhere doesn't mean anything to you. If you're watching, you know what I mean at youtube.com slash at Exit Philosophy. And an opportunity to remind you to go to griffsthepitch.com for all of Griff's work, multiple weekly columns, the weekly power rankings column, and a bunch of interesting interviews with current former Blue Jays, former Montreal Expos. You also get the Exit Philosophy podcast there. Griff, she's a warm one here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I was oot and a boot this morning. And I'm having a George Costanza moment. Um, had a shower when I got back and didn't take, man. It didn't take. Got me the sweats and I've lost more weight than the Dow has lost points <laughs> on this holiday Monday in Canada. But the sell-off in the U.S. continues. Well, I, I've got the perfect solution for myself in combating the hot weather. Um, I'm babysitting my daughter's cat, Mr. Rasho, named after Rasho Nesterovich, the great Raptors Slovenian star. Um, and so the dog, Kramer the dog and Mr. Rasho don't get along that well. So I am forced to sleep in the basement, which has the temperature of a meat locker. I love it. I wake up in the morning, six o'clock, cat licking my, licking my face, and I watch the Olympics. I've become a real Olympic basement fan here, as opposed to a closet fan. I'm a basement fan. I watch whatever they show early in the morning, and today is beach volleyball. Nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, well, what have you? What's kept your interest in the Olympics? Well, I'm, I'm not gonna lie off the top <laughs> because if I do and then start to give Polly Wally crappy analysis, I'll just doubt myself. I'm, I'm not opposed to the Olympics. I'm just not. It's not, I'm not somebody who plans my day around watching Olympic events. If it's on, this is the other thing, Griff. Um, like I, I watch a lot of Netflix when I have the TV on or I, I watch apps now. So I, I don't, I don't have cable TV. Um, I have Sportsnet now. Only because when it's not buffering, it it shows me Blue Jays games. Um, but but I don't really have cable TV, so therefore I really don't have network TV. So it's not like I pull out the remote control and just start flipping around and finding these things. But Summer Macintosh, I, I do see uh, highlights online and I do see interviews and all that. I think the obvious one for us is, is Summer Macintosh is having an out-of-this-world Olympics. She's 17 years old. What she's accomplished is absolutely incredible. And I remember the excitement and the appropriate hype around Penny Alexiak, who was a teenager in Rio eight years ago. Penny uh, has been outdone, um, which is no knock on Penny, but has been outshone by the performance of Summer McIntosh at these Olympics. And I I think it's a wonderful story for our our country. And um, again, I'm not going to sit here and get into medleys and freestyles and front strokes and backstrokes and this and that and the other thing. But there was the one race where Summer won by what felt like five seconds. I mean, she was like a quarter. It felt like a quarter of the length of the pool ahead of the silver medalist. So awesome story that she's authored here. Yeah, for me, and I've watched quite a bit of it. It's uh, Summer Macintosh, the pool, and it's nice to see some men get on the podium for Canada in the pool, and then it's the other sports. And that can change if Canada manages to medal or get to the championship game in basketball. That would be great. Uh, it's a really good team, of course, led by all those NBA guys, but this is... Uh, Summer McIntosh's games and the inspiration to the rest of the swim team is obvious. And the thing I love about Team Canada and Summer McIntosh is the the normalcy, the way that they take victory and defeat in stride. Um, if they win a medal, a gold medal, it's they're very happy. Meanwhile, the U.S. team 
if they finish with a silver, it's like the end of the world. You know, a bronze, oh my God, send me home. But uh, I guess it's just a difference in philosophy and expectation. But I've enjoyed it. I've never watched uh, this much Summer Olympics, but I'll, I'll thank Mr. Rasho over here for that. Yeah, and it sounds like, um, and and the, the scenics are amazing. The beach volleyball being played with the Eiffel Tower oh, yeah, in the background. Cool. So Paris, the French have done a great job of incorporating some of their best Except known cities, biggest monuments and, and biggest destination spots. And, and the uh, E. coli and the Seine river. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's a little insane in the membrane. Uh, you're you're an old hip hop fan, huh? Their walk up song is David Bowie's Aladdin Sane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's like a rainstorm in Toronto, Griff. <laughs> These days, the poop is going to get you, right? Yeah. When, when the poop hits the fan, <laughs> they thought they had it beat until the Belgian, uh, I guess, uh, the Belgian man in the triathlon came, and he now contracted E. coli, and the, their team withdrew from the mixed medley or the mixed triathlon. The entire Belgian team withdrew. So, like, you know, there might be a new Marvel superhero, a Belgian guy. I just bitten by yeah. something in the river. E. coli is E. coli can be fatal. So, I mean, we don't want to sit here and make a joke, but uh, I can tell you, if if you've ever had food poisoning or any kind of like even small scale E. coli infection, you're you're having about twenty four mixed medleys a day. <laughs> it, it, it's, well, uh, I mean, the 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 mayor of Paris dove in the river. We saw that, and mm -hmm. I think one of the senior ministers dove in the river. Can you see uh, Doug Ford diving into Lake Ontario to prove that it was okay? <laughs> I I just don't see it. Yeah, no, I, but, I don't. Uh, Th that must have been before all the E. coli uh, kicked up. But well, that, there were rumors of it, and that's why they wanted to prove that everything right. was good. Yeah. Um, so anyway, continue to enjoy it. The, the second week is is always great, too, because the track and field and the, the 100 meter race is always destination viewing. So we'll we'll be all over that and, and enjoy enjoy that. Meanwhile, we got well, we got Sh Shannon, my daughter's coming to pick up Mr. Rasho to, tonight or tomorrow. So I might not see as many Olympic sports as I have in the first week. <laughs> You're hoping it's tomorrow. Be honest. Oh God, I'm hoping it's tonight. Oh, oh, you're t you you you're, you've had enough of Mr. Rasho sitting on your face at six in the morning. Licking it is just like, oh my God! I just yeah. fed him some of that wet, crappy food, and now oh, nice. now he's licking my face. Oh my God! There you go. There you anyway, go. Anyway, let's get on to baseball here. So, are we? How are we doing? Are have we settled back in after the big dopamine rush? The great, the great sell-off i mean today it's the dow industrial average and last week it was the toronto blue jays after a a horrible season that remains horrible um even if we have dopamine rushes injected every now and then into into the middle of them uh, have we settled back in because the reality became clear in baltimore and and new york this is how it's going to be for the rest of the way and we know that this team is going to lose more than it wins and it's going to be a slog to the end. Yeah, I think that one thing that has happened across Blue Jays Nation is that there is less of a, a, a hand-wringing and angst about each and every game, every decision. I think fans are now looking to the individual parts rather than the, the, the underachieving sum of the parts. Like during the rain delay at Yankee Stadium – in a tie game with an inning left. I don't believe anybody really cared whether they won or lost that game. It's it's how the individual players are doing, how these kids are looking. And that's going to be the same for the last 52 games now. Uh, at the With one third of the season left, they were on pace to win 75. I think they'll be hard pressed to do that because that includes when they were really, really trying early on and not succeeding. Now you've got all these players, these parts that maybe shouldn't be there, some of them, showing they can play defense, but 
fundamentally not as sound as the group of veterans that they traded away. Nobody's expecting them to finish anywhere but last. So 70 to 70 to 80 wins, they're going to be in there somewhere, I think. And the difference between 70 and 80 to Blue Jays fans right now is insignificant. They want to see development. They want to see who's going to be in next year's rotation, who's going to be in next year's bullpen. And the bullpen is going to be probably the biggest struggle down the stretch in the last two months. Because if you only get six innings out of your starter and you need three innings out of the bullpen and you're mixing and matching and you choose the wrong left-hander in a certain situation of their two left-handers, it can become a very long and painful last three innings and last 50 games. Yeah. And I think some of the problems that existed before the trade deadline uh, will continue to resurface, even if for different reasons, the bullpen being one of them, you're just not going to have the arms. Um, you know, th that was an injury thing before July the 30th, and it is in part an injury thing now if you factor in a Jordan Romano, but it's also they traded Jimmy Garcia, and they uh, know he wasn't pitching well for the final month of his tenure in Toronto, but they traded a Trevor Richards, right? They DFA'd. Tim Mazo a long time ago now it feels so some of these problems are gonna are gonna crop up and you're going to see youthful exuberance uh lead to good results sometimes an exciting game here and there for certain guys you're gonna see youthful mistakes crop up and that's gonna cost them at times what what you want to see Griff is what you alluded to individual achievement I mean Vladimir Guerrero Jr is now in my view, a conversation piece once again, and I correct me if I'm wrong, you, you may argue that there should never have been a once again, it should have always been this way. I have fluctuated, but, but he is once again, a topic of conversation about term and dollar on a, on a long term contract. And, yeah. you know, these are the sorts of things they need to get organized in their minds. I think that the situation the Blue Jays find themselves in right now is very good for, in terms of Vlad putting up solid numbers the rest of the year. Uh, people are going to challenge him because this is a bad team. They're going to challenge him. They don't need to pitch around him. There's no situation where they're scared of, the Blue Jays offense. So let's see, let's just go after Vlad. There'll be games where they're down by seven runs, six runs, and, and all they want to do is get out. So they'll throw fastballs. It's it's going to be two months where Vlad, if he swings the bat as he's been doing the last two months, is going to put up really some substantial numbers. And, uh, you know, it's not going to mean anything because they are going to win between 70 and 79 games this year. But in terms of, fan perception of do they need to sign Vladimir Guerrero Jr. long-term, it's going to make a difference. And I just, you know, there's not really much to look at other than, than Vlad and maybe some of the younger players. Who's going to stay? Who's, who do, who's going to make this? Horowitz, for me, there's a spot for him next year. I mean, do, do I you mean, think, do you yeah. think if Horowitz continues – over the next two months to perform like he had, what's it been Griff? Has it been a month, six weeks? I can't. I it's over a month. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. way longer than a month. If he has a three and a half month period of, of solid ball, is he competing for a spot? I know it. I know it depends on free agency and trades in the off season and all that, but knowing what we know right now, is he competing for a spot? in the opening day lineup. I, I would argue he's the one guy who to me has, as long as he finishes strong and continues to show he I'd be comfortable with. Well, here's, I think he has to be there because I made a list of, if you have 13 position players, I made a list of the eight position players currently on hand that should be there on opening day of 25. And that means that you need to fill in five. 
So if you have Horowitz, who's borderline, I think he's better than borderline. He's got to make the team. Here's the here's the eight guys that I got: Kirk, and then in the infield, Vlad, Bo, Horowitz, Ernie Clement, who can back up Bo at shortstop. He's proving that plays a, a good third base. So he's a guy that should be coming off your bench. And I've got Barger because Barger showed that he's not afraid to swing the bat. He's not afraid of of power pitching. He's got an ability to to go for extra bases or a long ball coming off the bench, and he'll only get better as time goes on. Um, and then in the outfield, Varsho and Springer. I mean, Springer has – that's a contract you can't get rid of in the offseason anyway, and he's he's bounced back to the point where you can use him. But that's only eight players, and so you got to keep – and notice I don't have David Schneider on that list. I noticed I was going to bring yeah. his name. Up. No, he's, he's, it's been a grind for him for a couple months now. Yeah, he's in his last 31 games that he's played, he's got two RBIs and he's been batting in the middle of the, he's been batting uh, fourth, fifth, sixth, maybe mostly sixth or seventh. But you got to have more than two RBIs in 31 games. And that's what he's got. They have learned how to pitch to him in situations. They'll go after him with nobody on base, and that's why he's hitting 215. And he's hitting 215 with runners in scoring position also. But a lot of that was earlier in the season. Lately, not so much. And so I think the fact that he doesn't play a good second base, he can't be, we've talked about the need for a, one more offensive outfielder, offensive first outfielder. Uh, he's not that guy, and he doesn't play a good left field in the – it's a carousel around third base with coaches waving runners when a ball is hit to him on any routine ball. So to me, he's had his moment. And and there are eight guys, leaves room for five, and that will be the job of whoever the GM is in the offseason. All right. And, and a guy like Joey LaPerfito is he's got to prove himself. Proven himself and and is not. I don't. I don't care if he looks like Babe Ruth for the next two months. He is not penned in to left field next year. I mean that they Maybe. they have got to. La Perfido could be a guy, you know, who's your fourth outfielder, fifth outfielder. The, but uh, they, they they need to address uh, at particular positions, and we've talked about this left field in as 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 the standout. They've got to address that with offense. They yeah, have the, the Houston Astros thought they had their everyday uh, budding young left fielder and Derek Fisher. That didn't work out. The Cleveland then Indians um, thought they had Bradley Zimmer as their next can't miss outfielder. And to me, Joey Luperfito is in that category until proven otherwise. And you can't, I've listed eight names. He can't be on that list as a ninth guy if you plan on even contending for 85 wins, let's say, let's say optimistically they want to rebuild and, and go for 85 and maybe luck out to high eighties or 90. He can't, you can't just write him in as one of the 13 position players. Impossible. And, and there's Jonathan or Jonathan class a at, at Buffalo. And again, we're probably going to see him before the season is over and we hope he's exciting. I mean, he steals a lot of bases, uh, presumably can cover a lot of ground in the outfield. If he continues to work on the routes and just a lot of the things that young players have to learn. But I, I want, I, I, again, I, I call the trade deadline a dopamine rush. Oh my God, look at all these new names, people we need to learn about. And he's done this at double A and he was a third round pick in 2021 and he's 23 and he's 20 and this guy, this, and then what's his spin rate? And Get it into my veins. Everybody take a breath. This is a failed season. This is a pivot that... Clearly, the front office didn't expect to have to make. And we have learned a lot of new names. I mean, they they acquired 14 guys, 13 of whom, Ryan Yarbrough, the left-handed pitcher, excluded. 
who are prospects. Some are prospecty more than others, but this is not, and these are not necessarily the solution to the immediate problems. And Johnny Brainwave at the top of the organization tells us we can't judge anything for five years, which is why I'm going to wait two more before I say, come up with an edict on Jose Barrios for Simeon Woods Richardson, check the stats, who's pitched better this year. Uh, but there's still two more years. I'm being facetious, Griff. <laughs> I understand why he was acquired three years ago. He's a good pitcher. He's not a great pitcher, but a good pitcher, blah, blah, blah. But, but we just, we need, we, we need to A, pump the brakes, and B, we need to understand that as we talk about these players, we are learning far more than we actually know because we really don't know. And this was not how it was supposed to be. And there needs to be a far better engagement from ownership and a far better understanding of just how and why this all happened. Yeah, just to start with Jonathan, Jonathan Class A, his skill set reminds me of Anthony Ghost, and everybody was so high on Anthony Ghost, who was also young for his level. Uh, class A twenty. Well, class A will be pitching like his like Emmanuel in uh, <laughs> Maybe. five years. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but twenty two years old at Triple A is pretty good for Class A, and that was the. The thing that everyone pointed out about Anthony goes, just wait till he catches up. His skill set catches up with his body. 22, he was higher than he should have been. But that that didn't pan out. And as you point out, he ended up pitching. But, I, you know, in terms of what he had to do, of what the GM had to do, he did it. He had salary to get rid of. They were over that luxury tax of two hundred and thirty-seven million, which doesn't include just base salary. It includes uh, meal money and and lodging and and the players' association get, puts a bunch of other stuff in there as part of the basic agreement. But he had to get rid of all six expiring contracts, and then to get under that uh, that threshold, he had to get rid of IKF. IKF had a year left, very useful player. So now they are currently 9.5 million under the threshold. And that sort of relates to the adding up all of the, the two months worth of salary that they traded. So they had to do it. The Kiermaier waiver process before when he didn't get claimed and it was a big to-do that Kevin Kiermaier is on waivers. If somebody had taken that contract, they would have had a better understanding of how many deals they needed to make. Nobody took the contract. So Kiermaier went back into that pool of players that had to go. Um, to me, saying that Ross Atkins had a successful trade deadline is like a guy going to Harvard Law School too tough so he drops out and becomes a plumber becomes a really good plumber and everybody's high-fiving him for the great job he did replacing your pipes that is not what he was hired for getting rid of these guys at the deadline and he got 13 as you pointed out 13 prospects one who's already in the major leagues plus Yarbrough who's going to have a lot of innings to eat up in the last 52 games and Jake Bloss, who might be in the rotation as early as next week from the Astros. So he did a good job getting prospects. And I have a uh, theory on the ripple effect, which uh, you want to hear? I love um, I've got my bubbly. <laughs> Anybody watching Bublé. on YouTube? So yeah. the ripple effect of what I'm happened just... with the Blue Jays is that they got 13 prospects who have been distributed through the organization right now in Buffalo is uh, Nick Raposo, who they picked up on waivers after Jansen left. They picked him up from the Cardinals. That's a separate deal. Um, Will Wagner's playing third base in Buffalo. He's 25 years old. Class A is 22 years old at Buffalo. 
Uh, New Hampshire, they've got at shortstop Josh Rivera. Um, they got the outfielder, Yo Penango. And the, all these guys are in their top 30 now, have moved into the top 30 of Blue Jays prospects. Charles McAdoo is at uh, New Hampshire, slugging prospect. He, he might be a good one. R.J. Shrek, not a great prospect. He was acquired uh, in one of the last deals. Not great, but he's a prospect. Jay Harry. That was the Justin Turner trade, right? With Seattle, Shrek? Right, absolutely. Uh, Jay Harry, who is um, new, who is in Vancouver now. So he's at high A. He's 21 years old. Jacob Sharp in Vancouver, 22. He's a catcher. And Cutter Coffee also in uh, in Vancouver. So they've filled the system, and they at the same time here's the here's the ripple effect theory. At the same time, they announced 19 signings from the June draft or from the amateur draft, plus 11 other prospects, including an Oakville kid, Owen Gregg, a shortstop, went to Appleby College, and uh, so they've got. 30 first year pros all at the the minor league complex at the PDC plus these 13 players that they've sprinkled around the organization so what that means the 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 effect it has on every other prospect in the organization every other minor leaguers is that you can now play them at the level they should be the pool which was the PDC the complex league that team was 12 and 44 and the reason that they were 12 and 44 is their best players were being forced to play at higher levels, were being forced to play at Dunedin, Vancouver, some even at New Hampshire because of the paucity of talent in the Blue Jays organization. So now there, there's an influx. And it's not just these players whose names that you saw this week or the past two weeks. It's not just these guys, but it's the ripple effect they have on the entire system of minor league players where they can develop at their proper pace at their proper level and that 12 and 44 is deceiving because right now with all these players in the organization there's going to be at the end of the season a lot of players that weren't that talented but had to be there to fill holes they'll be released yeah. so it improves the organization more than just those names and i wanted to get that out there yeah yeah so we'll see I mean, we'll see where this all leads. I was I was laughing with your analogy, Griff, because I, I had a real life analogy from, uh, you know, I moved from Ottawa to Toronto to help launch TSN 1050 in April of 2011. And it took me eight months to find a family doctor. And so I go in for an appointment in December of 2011. And he takes a look at me and does the whole blood pressure and this and that and the other thing. We do some blood work and I get a call a week later Another appointment, I go in, uh, yeah, your blood sugar's high, you're pre-diabetic. And, okay, I'm 32 and a half years old. What do you do with information like that? Well, I changed my diet and I started working out. You know, do I deserve a damn medal because I started to look healthier and behave healthier after I made a mess of myself to the point that I almost became a diabetic? You know, I, I had to fix things that I made a mess of. And that's what this is. This is a mess that they don't have years to clean up. Now, I say that speaking logically. I'm not speaking Roger's ease. It is actually quite possible that they've got years because we don't know the extent to which ownership pays attention. Wow. There, there's a lot of there is a lot of power in the president's chair and unless someone there i mean the, the toronto blue jays are not under keith pelly's purview he's maple leaf sports and entertainment unless someone there is paying attention and actually wants and i i, I know the big thing at, at last october's season ending press conference from mark shapiro was we don't lay blame around here you know, we everybody's looking for someone to blame, which is actually code speak for and quite a psychological ploy. All of you out there who want accountability for this actually are just looking for somebody to blame. 
accountability is positive, blame is negative, and you want to blame, therefore you're the bad ones. And I don't know who's holding who accountable around there. That's a general issue with Big Red. Um, and and so I again, I mean, if 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 they make the right free agent signings and and swing some deals in the offseason and you look at their projected 26 man roster on opening day and say, man, this looks pretty good, then great. But they have a long friggin' way to go from the eight trades and 13 prospects they acquired on or before July 30th to being anywhere near competitive in 2025. It is doable. It is possible. But they need to shape the hell up in the offseason if it's going to happen. Yeah. When you talk about nobody in ownership, possibly nobody in ownership paying attention right now, I think the president knows that by the time the offseason arrives that there will be people paying attention because of the bottom line that they're going to see over the final two months because of the fact that uh, he convinced them, we're talking Mark Shapiro, convinced them to to build a state-of-the-art complex in Florida. Uh, they convinced the state of Florida and the, the the county to chip in money because there's going to be some very high-rolling professional athletes moving into the area so they can use the complex uh, six months in the off season. Um, he convinced ownership in Toronto uh, to put, to make a ballpark instead of a stadium and to put 400, 360 million to 400 million in renovations there. So that comfort level of a couple of years of sort of reveling in the moves that were made at the deadline and the drafting of two pitchers that may be as high as double a first and second round guys may be as high as double a starting next year. So they're accelerating the entire process of a rebuild and they were hoping to do it within the mm -hmm. six months of the off season. And what happened with that trade, trading off all those assets of expiring contracts, they weren't going to help in 2025. None of them, uh, you know, Ross Atkins apologized to the fans for believing that run prevention was the way to go. What did we talk about? He said, uh, creating an environment of run production. You need to create a better run scoring environment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> none of those guys that left... <laughs> None of those guys that left were going to contribute to that in 2025. So they now looking at salaries that went out and getting under the threshold uh, and then starting the clock of being penalized again because they are going to go over the threshold again because they have to compete. But it's going to be a new shot clock. Mm -hmm. um, so they have $45 million to spend on the other five guys plus whatever pitchers they may need to bring in. And I had them at nine pitchers that were useful. So four more. So they got nine positions to fill. Yeah. And, 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 and the and money they got to do 43 it. million plus the amount of penalty that they saved. And last year in 2023, they paid five point something million in penalties. And so you add that on. So say they got 50 million to spend and they, they have to now go to ownership and say, we're going to spend it better than we did this year. Same amount of money, but we're going to spend it better. We've already apologized to the fans. Um, we know that uh, this is going to be a competitive team if we do it correctly. But the thing is, can they build that team with a guy with a GM who's been there nine years and hasn't done it so far? Well, I, I see it, it feels like the mood around that whole situation has changed in the last week. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking amongst the fan base. Oh, I thought I'm, were, I'm talking about the rhetoric. I thought you were talking about fan base, but no, I, mean, I I have there's to less there's less fire Ross Atkins out there on social media right now. Well, because because it's over, Griff. Nobody's yeah, yeah. emotional. Yeah, that you, to the point to the, to the point you made about yeah. the rain delay on Sunday at Yankee yeah, Stadium. They win or they lose. What it it 
the trades have been made. No, nobody, nobody's viewing this through a prism of they need to win today because yeah. they got to gain Absolutely. a game or you know all of that. Yeah. And I and mean, so it's a it's a lost season, right? So it is a season in which even the most rabid Blue Jays fans don't need to see every game on television anymore, which is going to show on the bottom line for ownership, because that's what they base a lot of their, uh, their panache and their, their presence in the market on is, is the numbers that watch on television. Cause that's their baby. Uh, it's not going to be the same in August and September. We already see large sections of empty seats, clearly tickets sold because they're still announcing 37 to 40,000 people per game. But those people aren't coming. Same way that you may have the Rogers Sports Pack on your portable device and then not look at it for that months of August and September because you don't care. And apathy is is a big part of what ownership is going to encounter at the end of the season when they say, okay, uh, Mark, convince me that you need to spend uh, and be the sixth highest payroll again when you're the 24th best record. Convince me. Yeah, but it, it, the other flip side of the coin of that, Griff, is that sports brands command loyalty, and there are people who view it through that prism, right? I, I'm I'm with Team A through thick and thin. And, you know, I like to think of myself as Canada's biggest and most committed San Francisco 49ers football fan. But you're not was was I was I locked in every week in 2016 when Chip Kelly was urinating down his leg and the team went two and 14 to the same extent that I'm locked in every single week with Kyle Shanahan taking his team deep into the NFC playoffs into the occasional Super Bowl like obviously not i still love the team but it 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 doesn't hold that same intensity but if i'm a season's ticket holder and i have been for a long time and maybe i inherited those from my parents who inherited them from their parents my grandparents dating back to 1977 and we've moved around through Exhibition Stadium, Skydome, now Rogers Center, the renovations, et cetera. Like, I may just not want to give those up, right? Or or what am I doing on Wednesday night, August the 15th or whatever? I don't know what date Wednesday is, or it doesn't even matter. But what am I doing? To, well, I don't really have much going on. I'm, I'm just going to tune in, and it'll be background noise. Well, we put Polly to bed, you know? So it, it's it's... I, I, it's hard to get a measurement on, on where this all goes because the sample size is relatively small. If you think back, Griff, and you know, I did that thing a few weeks ago where like the Toronto Blue Jays in, in this century are one of the least accomplished yeah. on field major league baseball teams. And it's an easy demarcation point because it's the turn of the century and it's a quarter century now, essentially. And it's also just coincidentally, and for the purposes of my little thing that I did, and you can go back and listen to it, not so coincidentally, the time when Rogers bought the team, um, you know, there were 20 years of just never winning more than 88 and never losing more than like 89 and, and it was just meh. There were almost no September games that ever mattered. Uh, I think in 2000, they went and got like Steve Traxel and Dave Martinez and made like a half-assed effort to, to con David Segui might have been involved in that too. But like there were never really any years where they were serious. And you saw the attendance reflect that over time. I still think that this incarnation, and I go back about a decade when I described this incarnation, with the uniform change in 2012, with the uh, the hype, not the immediate success, but the hype around the 2012-2013 offseason trades, the bat flip, 
Encarnacion's wild card walk off a year later, the back to back championship series appearances, the excitement of the come up in 2020 uh, shortened season. They, they made those manufactured playoffs, the excitement of 21 down to the last day, the playoff appearances in 22 and 23, what goes on in Seattle one weekend every year, what goes on in Minnesota, what goes on in Detroit or Cleveland, like I, I, I think there's a feeling around this team that, you know, there's a, I don't know the extent to which there's going to be this big immediate pushback. It might take years of mediocrity, and we've seen an ownership group that's been, at least in the past, been comfortable with that. Here's a question for you. I want to hear your opinion on it. What if, in either 22 or 23? the Blue Jays had made a run and equaled what they did in 2015 and 16, got to the championship series, lost, didn't go to the World Series. What would the reaction be this year to a disappointing year? Just advancing two more rounds in the postseason than they did in the, either of those and actually winning games in October. What do you, do you think that would have saved the perception of this group? Do you think maybe they wouldn't even have traded Teoscar and Lourdes and Gabby Moreno? Do you think that the whole thing changes? Because I remember in 81 when the Expos, and it always comes back to me, for me to the Expos, when they lost on Rick Monday's home run, the panic that set in that this team was almost there, wasn't good enough, let's trade Larry Parrish. Say Larry Parrish is the equivalent of Teoscar. Trade Larry Parrish. And bring in Al Oliver, who won a uh, batting title and an RBI crown, but wasn't the same in the clubhouse. It wasn't the same in the dugout. And they never had that success again. Do you think that winning something last year might have changed what happened off the field? I I would argue, Griff. Oh, well, okay. So you're like, in terms of moves made by the front well, office, I mean, just in general. perception by the fans. Yeah. Uh, like if they had, if they had lost in two or three to Minnesota and it had not happened in a way in that second game where it was the smartest guys in the room syndrome, you know, and then, and then that seemed to unlock a lot of it, it 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 made more apparent and more clear because there was now a result to attach to a lot of what you'd hear about what went on in the background and the difficulty communicating. And they made a big deal about that and talked about that. And then really all they did was do Dave Hudgens a favor and move him closer to Mar-a-Lago um, <laughs> and, and, and change some other titles uh, among among the hitting group the, of coaches and and you, you like that one i eh? <laughs> um hey he tweets uh or he x's or he posts whatever it is but but like it just the vibe the vibe's been off for longer than they've struggled and the Barrios decision in the second game in Minnesota sort of ripped the facade off that because they get on and win the world series last year. And there still would have been issues behind the scenes. It just, they would have gotten hot at the right time and been champions. So, so I think, I think it is possible Griff that your posit there, your suggestion could have changed some things both in terms of how the fans perceived the team because it would not have ripped the facade off and you know the front office may have made some different decisions uh, but but I do think ultimately results catch up and make apparent the good the bad the ugly the indifferent in your organization and that was a breaking point last fall they really, other than going for it with Otani, which as you've outlined was a business decision, th after that didn't work, and who really thought it would, um, they just doubled down on some of the same kinds of guys that they had in 2022. And, you know, this year they might try and sell. Well, we, then we had some bad luck. We had, we had a world-class bullpen last year, and 
and a starting rotation of five guys who who went out there every day. And we, I mean, did they even use a six starter last year? Maybe once. Well, now the injuries did it, and this and that. You, you can always come up with stuff and reasons why a season goes off the rails. But yeah, you know, I, I I think I think there was a turning point last year, and I don't think it was properly addressed. Yeah, and and you can talk a good game as the Blue Jays front office, and and Lord knows that I want the Blue Jays to win as many games as they can because I have a lot of people, and I worked four years for the team. I have a lot of people in that clubhouse that I like. Pete Walker is a good friend of mine. There's a lot of people in that clubhouse that I like. But to me, if you are the front office and you say, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna learn from our mistakes." We're going to create an environment of what is it more run producing a, a better. We need to do a, a better job of creating a, or of building a run creating yeah. environment. Run creating right. environment. So, how in the off season? Because baseball players, successful baseball players, players going on the free agent market are paying attention. You signed Justin Turner because this was a situation that looked like it was going to be a winning situation. You signed Chad Green, uh, got him to come back because of the same thing. Uh, in the past few years, they've been able to say, hey, we're building, we're heading in that direction. But how do you do that in this offseason, even if you target somebody and you have the same front office people approaching this run-creating machine that can help the Blue Jays in 2025? How do you convince him that this is the target that – this is your landing spot. This is where you should be to help us get back to where we were. Well, but in the other question I would have, if if the money is going to be the same and sometimes Toronto has to pay a little more or give an extra year because the tax situation and, <laughs> you know, you can go to Houston or, or the Rangers, Texas, and have no state income tax. You can go play. Uh, well, I don't know why you'd want to, but you could go hasn't play it, for Miami. Yeah, hasn't and, it helped in Miami? <laughs> no state income tax, right? Or or Tampa, uh, who doesn't sign anybody of consequence anyway to big contracts. But like I would be asking as a player who presumably is going to cash in wherever I end up. So like the whole Vladdy thing is, are you going to be here beyond 2025? Yeah. Like what's going on with your shortstop is, is, Bo Bichette's one of your better players. I know he had a bad year in 2024 and he was injured at times, but like, is, is he here for the long term? And if he's not, who's replacing him? And George Springer's coming up near the end and Kukuchi's gone and Bassett's on his last year and Gosman's into the final two years of his deal. Like, where's this going? So if I sign a five or a six or a seven year contract with you, what are we going to look like in? three or four years not even five or six years because that's hard to project anyway but like in two three years what are we going to look like what am i signing up for yeah you know? and to me that's exactly the that might be the only reason that such an oddity such an odd event happened i think it was in new york at yankee stadium it might have been in baltimore where john schneider decided that he needed to have and i'm sure he was advised by those in upper front office he needed to have a clubhouse meeting and with only the veteran players and tell them where this organization was headed and because it looks like they're headed into the tank but as we've discussed on exit philosophy over and over and over they need to compete in 25 so he had to pass that front office message on to his veteran players that we are going to compete in 2025 and then, of course, to your point, they turn to their right and they see Vlad sitting there with no contract beyond 25. And they go, oh, prove it, prove it. And to prove it, to me, they need to sign Vlad. And, and we've talked about that over and over and over. His numbers aren't going to get any worse if you wait. But as we also pointed out, the Blue Jays don't like to set the bar on superstars. They like to sort of... Uh, go near the bar, the level that's set by someone else, go under the bar, because Scott Boris is going to set the bar with Juan Soto, I would imagine. Is he going to do that before or after March Well, 15th? that's it. I think that, and this is just a, a, a thought, that after the disaster of Scott Boris's offseason last year, that he may be one of the first 
off the mark that he may say, okay, that didn't work. This game is changing. The whole landscape of free agency is changing. And, and I know that Soto and Vlad are different because they're so young in the free agency process, but he may go early. And if that happens, that's going to help the Blue Jays. The longer the Blue Jays wait in the off season to tie Vlad up to a long-term deal, the harder it will be for them to sell tickets because people aren't going to believe we're going for it, but we're letting Vlad play out his contract. Well, and the other thing, Griff, is there's nobody coming. I, I know there's a, an excitement over the 13 acquisitions, but there's nobody. There, there's nobody in the minor leagues right now that has Vladdy's pedigree when he was coming up, Bo's pedigree when yeah. he was coming up. There, there's no, hey, that Just guy, that's the here. beacon. Yeah. That's the beacon down the road. That's why they right? need to that's why they need to put all those dollars in the Vladimir Guerrero Jr. basket because and that's why the homegrown guy, he understands the organization. He can talk to incoming players. He can be a, a recruiting scout to some, you know, mid-level free agents who know him and respect him. And I think that that's underrated and undervalued in terms of tying up your own guys or having one of your own guys who's come up through the organization be a spokesman for you. Do you, do you think, I know we're going down a road here now, but do you think you'd have to do an opt-out after like four or five years? Because he would want, at 30 or 31, he would want to do the Miggy Cabrera deal or the Alex Rodriguez thing where, and then you lock in another five years on top of that. And I know we're way down the road at this point, Griff. Like, you know, I'll be 60 years old when this matters, <laughs> but, but friggin', you know, he's 40 years old and he's cooked like Miggy Cabrera was cooked yeah. for three years with Detroit at the end, but yeah. he was making a killer sum. So he couldn't just cut him. You know what I mean? Like, and he had earned the right to go out on his own terms. Well, that, I just that, wonder how that all ends up looking much earlier in this discussion on, in this hour, you talked about the fact that sometimes because they're playing in Canada, they're playing in Toronto, they got to give more money, more term. I think more term comes into play and it's that extra Miggy Cabrera type year where, you know, he's not going to be productive, but you don't want him to be like $35 million for the first seven years. So you add a couple of years, throw guaranteed money at the end. It's almost like the Dodgers did only they just did it right in your face with Shohei Otani say, yeah, we're, we're down the road 30 years, but you can add, if you're the blue Jays, you can add term in terms of an extra two or three years that, you know, he's not going to be productive, but you need to do it to get him signed now. And, yeah. and like you worry about that when the time comes, because you, you just got to get it done, you know? Um, we got a few more minutes here. I, I, we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up the Chicago White Sox. Oh, before we get into the Chicago White Sox, I got one more theory about how the Jays are going to go about saving the final two months. It's okay, two words. It, it, and then I want to hear your theory about how the White Sox are going to save the final two <laughs> months. No, okay. But the, the Jays, the two words are Joey Votto. It's time for Joey Votto. They got three or four guys on their 26 man roster who aren't productive, who aren't used, who don't help uh, in terms of appeasing the fan base. And Joey Votto will. He's at Buffalo. He homered. He's, you know, he's swinging the bat. Uh, if he's healthy, then he needs to be called up as an occasional, depending on how he's swinging the bat at DH. He can be the left handed hitting DH. And if you need to get, a Vlad or a Springer or somebody off their feet, you just sit Votto and you you put that guy in at DH. I think there's no downside that this is a time if Votto is healthy to bring him up. And Bo Bichette. You know, I, I, I'm i not going to sit here and lie and and say that, you know, I watched every pitch of every inning of the Yankees series, Griff, but, you know, typically those guys are around um you know Bo at some point i think is is going to have to go out on a minor league rehab assignment right i mean he's missed enough time now yeah. 
Yeah, you a can't couple just of, step right back in. You know, you, you I, I'd like to believe that we've sort of been the body language police here and wondered about what's going on. And, and he acknowledged to Rosie DeMano in the, in the star about a month, month and a half ago that he's got to find that fire again, kind of confirming what our eyeballs were telling us. You know, I'd like to believe that he would be powered up to want to have a good final five or six weeks of the season, you know, try and salvage his own personal statistics to some extent. Bernie needs to play the final month. He needs to be ready. He can't just, they can't just shut him down because he's only got one more year on his contract. He's making $17 million off of that three-year deal that he signed leading him into free agency, which was a pretty decent, a pretty good idea for both sides. But he needs to play that last month and and find himself in terms of swinging the bat and, and know that he's ready to go. I, did it's going to be very hard to trade him in the offseason. I don't even think they want to anymore because you're not going to get back the max. He, they might get more at the trade deadline if he has a great first half than they would this offseason coming off the year that he's had. But he needs to play that last four or five weeks. Um, and that's just the bottom line. And then they can decide. We can observe. We can – fans can – sort of say, give their opinion on, on whether Bo should be a part of the future, but Vlad for sure. And, and uh, Bo is the mystery of, of Blue Jays life right now. White Sox have lost 20 in a row. They earlier this year had a losing streak of 14 in a row. So um, it's going well. They're on pace to, potentially they're a little short of this but it's possible griff the way they're going they could lose 125 games this year like that would be a if they do that would be a record of 37 and 125 in my lifetime the 43 and 119 Alan Trammell led 2003 Detroit Tigers powered by Mike Maroth who I think lost 20 games that year back when wins and losses still mattered to pitchers that's that's the low point they seem poised to blow past this and what's interesting to me about it griff is that 3 years ago maybe four years ago now, but like within the last three years, Tony La Russa was managing that team because the owner, Jerry Reinsdorf, who's in his eighties, wanted to correct what he felt was a, a, a mistake from about a half a lifetime ago when he let La Russa go yeah. as manager of the White Sox in the mid eighties. And then La Russa went on and won with Oakland and won a couple times with St. Louis and had world series appearances with the A's that he didn't win as well. I mean, you know, highly regarded guy, in the dugout and they would built this thing up. They'd done the trade with the Chicago Cubs to get a young Dylan Cease and Eloy Jimenez for Jose Quintana. And they'd, you know, they had Louis, uh, Louis Robert and, you know, Kopik and you go on and on. They brought in Yasmani Grandal, who was still a good player at the time to, to catch on a four-year contract and sort of round this thing out. And it was like, man, the White Sox are poised to, to own this American league central division for a while. And like, it isn't even like poof, it disappeared. It, it's like somebody dropped a meteor into the center of their earth and just crushed everything and, and exploded. What wasn't crushed. This is unbelievable. And I'm, I, I, I give two craps about the white Sox in general, but I would watch the ESPN 30 for 30 on what happened here a decade from now. This is unbelievable how bad they are yeah you mentioned and i forgot the incident from last year that sort of told you that things were not right in that clubhouse and in that front office well what was the exact incident that, that we were talking about from last year well it was just um who went over to the yankees was it that oh, middleton guy yeah or... keenan middleton keenan, yeah and, and he just said look there's no leadership in there there are no rules yeah um and you know uh 
Pedro Grafal, the manager, is is under fire. Our old buddy Charlie Montoyo is the bench coach there for the White Sox. I'm not bringing that up to hang some of this on him. I'm not saying that, but he's there. And it's just, I just don't know how, and even that, Griff, that doesn't mean you're such a bad baseball team that you you don't even clear the 40 win mark in a 162 game season, (laughs) you know, like, I mean, whatever's going on there, it is, I just find it astounding that, and I I was, I was eight going on nine at the start of the 1988 season when the Baltimore Orioles lost 21 straight games to begin the year. The, the, the White Sox with a loss would tie that record and obviously two more losses in a row would set the new American league loss, uh, uh, American league record for consecutive losses. The Philadelphia Phillies, I believe own the major league record of 23 consecutive losses. So the white Sox could very uh, clearly clear that as well. It's just, there are train wrecks and then there's whatever this is. Yeah. No, nobody wants to take over that. I mean, even if they wanted to change managers midstream, nobody would want to take that job right now. Nobody. So they'll let the likely let him finish the season and then just clear the decks in that dugout and in that clubhouse. But I think I remember the covering the, the tigers when they were on their way to record loss total and going up to Marath as he lost his 18th game at Rogers at Sky Dome, Rogers Center by then maybe. And, uh, and I was one of three guys going to ask him about losing 20 games, the possibility. And it hadn't been since whenever. Um, and Dimitri young was two lockers over and he came over and started screaming at us for even asking the question, you know, that's how on edge that clubhouse was. So I can imagine in September how that White Sox clubhouse this year is going to be. But the thing about, I don't think that they will set any sort of modern record for losses in a season because in August and September, especially late August and all of September, you're going to have managers on other teams resting their best players against the White Sox because they stink. They're gonna they're gonna see the worst starting pitchers in the rotation. You'll set your rotation up not to face the White Sox, but to face maybe the 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 Guardians or whoever is up next on your schedule. And and that will help. And there won't be the same uh, emotion and enthusiasm from an opponent going into whatever that stadium is called and on the south side guaranteed rate field yeah yeah, that's it or guaranteed loss field but but there won't be that opponent enthusiasm and it will allow kids on that white Sox roster trying to prove themselves for 2025 to succeed a little bit and you know you, you see teams headed for record loss totals and it never happens because of that because people don't take them seriously in the final month and a half White Sox are kicking off a three-game series. Now, we're talking to you on Monday, August the 5th, the civic holiday in in Canada. uh, Natal Day in Nova Scotia, Griff. I just want to... What is it? Natal Day. Like in in this area, it's it's essentially a celebration of the start of the... uh, or like the creation of Halifax and Ah. the Dartmouth across the harbor. I see. Um, um, I haven't really brushed up on any of the details beyond that is there heavy but, drinking involved uh there can be oh, yeah terrific yeah if you'd like to come by and ramp that <laughs> up for us it would help uh they're 27 and 87 27 wins 87 losses that's a 23.7 percent win percentage and they have a three-game series in oakland starting tonight so if they're going to tie this major league record they only got to lose tonight to tie the american league record and then lose tomorrow to set it. But if they're going to tie the Philadelphia Phillies major league record, they're going to have to work really hard because they've got three games in Oakland. And then they go home to play the Cubs. So could you imagine if the Cubs have the chance to hang the 24th record-setting loss (laughs) on the White Sox? Oh, man. 
both teams in Oakland uh, for this three game series have checked this off as uh, a soft part of their schedule, <laughs> but you can't have both teams doing it. It's like when you're at the poker table and you look around looking for the sucker, don't see him. You're it. Yeah. And that's the white Sox situation. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. It's like, this is like the day the music died. This is the day Mark Kotze died. The manager of the Oakland A's looking around going, what the hell empty stadium. We're going to Sacramento. What's <laughs> What's happened to me? Oh, my. God. So, Jays fans, uh, it could be worse. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's our message. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and White Sox fans, I actually don't think it could be worse. I mean, theoretically, you could go 0 and 162, but that just never happens. So, I don't yeah, think it could be worse. I mean, there there's the... The total is nowhere near the sum of its parts because, as you pointed out, they did have some talented players at the start of the schedule, and and they certainly have taken the opportunity to get rid of a lot of that talent. But I mean, if you're in the major, if you have 26 major league players, doesn't mean they're major leaguers; they're just major league players right now, and then that's what they seem to have, and it. You know, you talk about a weak link in your bullpen, and that's the Jays' problem. If you've got to use three relievers and one of them fails every night, you're going to look really, really bad. And if in the White Sox situation, two of them fail every night, you're going to lose 20 in a row. That's all yeah. there is to it. We'll put a wrap on uh, Exit Philosophy, episode 31 of the second season. Remind you to head over to griffsthepitch.com for all of Griff's work. Uh, YouTube.com slash at Exit Philosophy. Uh, if you're listening wherever you get your podcast, you can also watch old episodes there. Please like, please subscribe, please give us a five star review on on Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. That always uh, helps to ramp things up for us. And uh, should remind you, YouTube.com/slash at Exit Philosophy. Griff and I do select post game shows, and we also did a deep dive last. Uh, what was it? It was the 30th. Um, I, I get my days mixed up, Griff. The, the 30th of July was what day of last week? The trade deadline. We yeah. did a live post, post trade Tuesday. deadline show. Yeah, it's, post, it's on there anyway. It's yeah, there. Tuesday of last week. But you look it up, it's there. Um, and uh, and so that's something else to look for from us at youtube.com slash philosophy. And uh, barring the unforeseen as the Blue Jays come home to play the Orioles and... Uh, then the Oakland A's uh, will be back with you no later uh, than next Monday. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Scotty. Thanks, everyone. Go Joey Votto. Go Jake Bloss. Let's go.